Okay, I've updated the way these slides look by popular demand so that hopefully we can all read these slides and everything. Um, we are going to talk about generators and filtration. It is, uh, what, chapter 17 in our textbook. So, uh, I am going to continue, um, even in the light of recent events, to talk about, um, can we let him in? To talk about um, generators and power and KVP and mass using this gun metaphor, right? Um, because I do think it, it's going to help us, help us to kind of connect with some of the, this understanding. Um, so primarily though, my purpose is in these objectives is to, we want to be able to think about how generators affect both quantity and quality of x-rays produced. Um, we want to list those qualities um, affected by generator power and those things that are not. So that'll be the technique don't and technique do part of things. And then we're going to change gears and we're going to start talking about filtration. So there's a lot in this chapter because he unpacks both how generators works and then he changes gears and he starts talking about filtration. Those are two different subjects that he's packed into one chapter. Finally, we're going to come away with our first definition of what half value layer is. And this is going to serve us not only in this class, but also in radiation biology. And we'll, we'll, find, we'll wrap up with just at least talking about uh, compensating filtration because if I didn't talk about it, we'd wind up being confused about filters. So, I found this meme that was published a, a little while after the, the shooting that was in Florida. And I think it's helpful to think about um, the way, and now I'm not trying to get up on a soapbox and tell y'all how to vote or whatever politically, but I do feel like these school shootings have become epidemic, right? And it's something that your generation, I would say, is tasked with getting pretty serious about. Because I don't think it's current the current generation of politicians that are seeking meaningful change. And I'm not advocating one way or the other. But I, I do want to point out that it, when the Constitution was drafted, the typical Revolutionary Era musket was capable of firing one round at an effective firing rate of three rounds per minute with a muzzle velocity of 1,000 and a maximum range of accuracy of about 50 yards. That's a maximum range of accuracy. So that's what the Constitution was written based on, right? Versus an AR-15 has a, has a muzzle capacity of 30 rounds, an effective firing rate of 45 rounds per minute, which means you could fire basically almost a one and a half clip in a minute, right? A muzzle velocity of 3,260 uh, feet per second, and a maximum range of accuracy of 550 meters. So that's what was currently out there on the streets. Right? When we're talking about power generation, understanding that distinction is helpful. Right? Now, I'm not trying to scare anyone or, or be creepy, but I want us to acknowledge that I'm using a metaphor that's a charged metaphor. Right? I think it's a helpful metaphor, but if, if this is bothering anyone, please let me know and I'll stop using this metaphor. I'll figure out a different way to think about this. Okay? Um, but anytime we increase the power generation, we're basically moving up from a revolutionary musket up to contemporary stuff. And just like when you move up in the musket power, and you're going to increase firing rate, you're going to increase range, you're going to increase um, things like uh, how quickly you can make the x-rays, all of that is being influenced. Right? So what we're saying is both quantity and quality has changed. When I moved from an, a previous generator of x-ray power to a more contemporary high frequency generator, I've changed both quantity and quality. Because that's the metaphor we're using. We're using that, like the caliber is like the KVP, the amount of buckshot is like our mass, and now if we change the generator, we're changing how quickly we can move through both of those. Are you tracking with me? Oops. So. Increasing power generation increases both the quantity and quality of x-ray production. So if we increase the power generation from half wave rectification, that's 60 cycles per second, to full wave rectification, 120 cycles per second, this doubles the exposure and increases the effective MA. That's straight out of the textbook. 
Let me draw you a picture of what that looks like. I'm going to zoom in. And I'll zoom back out. The half wave rectification looks like this. We had a sine wave, right? And we basically just sawed off the negative parts of the sine wave. And we just are using the one part up top. So we've, we've got a x-ray here, no x-ray. X-ray here, no x-ray. It's like the guy in Revolutionary War times having to reload his musket, right? Reload and fire, reload and fire, right? So this is half wave rectification. This is what the waveform literally looks like. And when it says that there's a 60 cycles per second, what that's saying is that there's 60 of these little bumps every second. So one thing that this may bring into your mind is the difference between the high frequency room that we have, the big room, versus the small room on the spinning top test. This is the reason why we were able to see the little dots. Is it's, it's firing and reloading and firing and reloading. So it's half wave rectified, okay? Versus full wave, now we've got something more like the machine gun. We've got, we were able to flip the wave up over the line. So we've increased the frequency with which we're firing. We've increased the, the quantity of photons being produced. We've also increased the quality as well, okay? But let's focus right now for on just the quantity, okay? To really change the quality of the x-ray, we need to start thinking about moving from three phase, uh, moving up to a three phase power generation, okay? So each increase in power generation increases the effective KV and beam penetration. So again, now, since we're using the more high-powered weapon, it shoots further and harder. It has a better accuracy. The, the metaphor is not perfect, all right, but it kind of helps. So a three-phase x-ray machines are twice as penetrating as single-phase generations. We'll look at that, why that's the case. And finally, battery-operated portable x-ray machines are slightly more penetrated than even the three-phase generators. So it used to be the case that if I was using the portable machine, I had to reduce my KVP a little bit because it was going to be more powerful than the machine back in the department. Now, that's not the case really very much anymore. Most of y'all, the departments that you're working with, have state-of-the-art equipment, and those distinctions aren't as noticeable. But for the most part, since a battery-operated machine is using direct current, there's no need to change phases with anything. It's just a direct current. Okay. So, but I do want to draw this out. Okay. So I'm going to zoom in one more time. What we're talking about with three phase, and this is for those of those of you I made sing in rounds. I'm apologize. I'm not going to make people sing in rounds again. But imagine singing row 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 your boat. Right. That's the first group singing row 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 your boat. Right. Now we tell another group to start singing row 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 your boat. So they're slightly out of sync, right? Now we tell a third group, three phase. We tell the third group, sing, row, row, row your boat. And what we've done in having these three different groups sing is we've now upped the average KVP up to this range right here. So this is three phase power. It never really dips below this line, right? There's, the energy is always being produced up in this area. The x-rays are always being produced up in here, and they're more or less continuous, right? Now, you'll notice from your textbook, once you get to three-phase, not a lot's changed. You can go to three-phase six-pulse, three-phase 12-pulse, high-frequency. Things don't change that much. I would familiarize yourself on what those terms mean, though. It is helpful to know that what I've drawn out here is three-phase. Now, if you start to think, okay, what is six pulse? Well, how many pulses have I got right here? Right now I've only got three pulses. If I started adding even more pulses, I'm increasing just by some fraction of an amount the percentage of effective KV. Does that make sense? And I think that's detailed in our textbook on page 264. You can see 
that as we change from three phase six pulse, it says about 91% of the set KVP, three phase 12 pulse, about 97% of the set KVP. I'm not interested in you memorizing that. But I, what I do want you to recognize is that for each increase in power generation, we have a relative increase in effective KVP. So that affects things like subject contrast, it affects things like half value layer, all that stuff, right? That's the way we need to be thinking about it. Questions so far? Okay. So, um, generator dues. What the generator does is as we have a higher KVP, so there's a higher average KVP that's generated from high power generators, this is going to increase penetration and slightly decrease subject contrast. So as I increase power generation, I am also affecting average KVP and as a result decreasing subject contrast. Okay, because as KVP goes up, subject contrast goes down. They're inversely related. High power generation also allows for decreased exposure times. Yes, question. So um, decreased exposure time is our friend. You've already seen that in some of my test questions. Because we have decreased exposure times, we have decreased patient motion, right? And so this would have an indirect effect on image sharpness, but hold the phone for just a sec. Generators do not affect sub, uh, sharpness at all. It is not a causative link, okay? So be very, very careful with that. What I'm saying is, as I increase my power generation, I could potentially decrease my exposure time. That means less motion, less blur. So drunk patient's not gonna be rolling all over my image, right? Crying baby's not gonna be flailing all over on my image and making a blurry picture. But it is not a causative thing. Uh, increasing the generator power does not directly cause an increase in sharpness. Okay? It is, does not directly cause it. Okay? So he points that in the textbook, but I wanted to emphasize it. Power generation is an electrical variable, and so it's unrelated to any geometrical qualities. Sharpness, magnification, shape distortion, it does not control that stuff. It controls KVP and mass more accurately, average KVP and effective MA. Um, it's not a contributor to image noise. Okay. Let's talk about, so I'm going to change gears now. Changing gears and the last part of ballistics that we're going to talk about is filtration. Perhaps the way that we could think about filtration, and again, this is an area where students get confused, so the metaphor I'm going to use is like rifling, right? The filtration functions almost like rifling. When we put spin on something, it causes it to go further, and it can spin longer. Like if I set a top spinning or a basketball spinning, it will, it will spin and it will stay upright. So what filtration does is it allows us to filter out the useless x-rays so that what we have flying at the patient is just the high quality stuff okay so the primary purposes purpose of filtration is radiation protection I'll say that three times the primary purpose of filtration is radiation protection the primary purpose of filtration is radiation protection that is why we filter the beam it is purely for radiation protection purposes you're going to see all sorts of distracting questions about that, and you're just going to hear my annoying voice saying, hopefully, it is just for radiation protection. It eliminates the low energy x rays from the beam. And the term that we use for that is hardening the beam. We sometimes talk about hardening the beam. So, there are two types of filtration that are combined to form the total filtration of the x ray machine. The total filtration of the x-ray machine includes inherent filtration, and that's the parts of the tube, the oil, the beryllium window, the collimator mirror, potentially, 
all have a way of filtering the x-rays. They could filter out weak x-rays, right? We're going to call that inherent because it's part of the way the machine is designed. It's part of the way the machine is built. We may need to add filtration. And I can show you all what it looks like. It literally looks like if you want to just open up your kitchen cabinet and pull out some aluminum foil, that's what I'm talking about. It is just aluminum foil that they have exactly measured the thick the thickness and uniformity of, and they're using it to filter out the low energy x-rays. It is generally between the collimator and the tube that they place the added filtration. In fact, that older machine, I can show you the slot where the added filtration is added. Um, so sh thin sheets of generally aluminum or aluminum equivalent that are installed between the uh, tube and the collimator. All x-rays machines, and this is something we just have to memorize, um, all x-ray machines operating at 70 kVp must have a minimum total filtration equivalent to 2.5 millimeters aluminum equivalent. 2.5, just memorize it, 2.5. So what that's saying is every diagnostic x-ray machine you will ever operate unless you want to change careers and become a dental hygienist has to have 2.5 millimeters aluminum equivalent. Has to. And again, that goes back to characteristic x-ray production and what we know about how these x-ray tubes function. All right. So I'm going to change gears yet again and transition slightly from filtration to half-value layer. The half-value layer is a big subject. We will spend more time talking about it, but we might as well introduce it now because it will help us better understand how filtration is working. So, Filters remove low energy x-rays, so the quantity of x-rays in the beam decreases. It's removing the low energy x-rays, so we just dropped the quantity. The average quality of the x-ray beam, though, increases. So we dropped the quantity, but we increased the average quality, and we call this hardening the beam. It's a good thing. It's a good thing, okay? Um, the way that we measure that then is with the half value layer, the half value layer. But I do want to spend just a little bit of time on these graphics real quick because I think these are helpful graphics. The first one is showing us both uh, short wavelength x-rays, so the high energy x-rays, and long wavelength x-rays, right? I'll zoom in. So we've, on the north side of the filter, we've got some short wavelength x-rays. This one right here has a short wavelength and then some long wavelength. What the filter did was it stopped this guy. It stopped the low energy long wavelength photon and it allowed this guy to just keep on traveling. He just keeps on trucking, right? It did not slow him down. It did not make me lose him. He keeps on going, right? So I didn't lose anything helpful. I just filtered out the stuff that was not helpful, the low energy x-rays. So to transition to then half value layer, let's look at this graphic. It may be a little bit more confusing. What I've got is both the discrete x-ray spectrum and the continuous x-ray spectrum. So I said the continuous x-ray spectrum is related to what type of x-ray production in the tube? Who remembers? Begins with the brims and ends with the strolong, right? So the continuous x-ray production is being made by brems strolong throughout the x-ray energy spectrum. So everything from just above zero kilo electron volts to whatever my kVp was like 100 kVp, let's say, just for the sake of ease. So this is the spectrum of energies that's being produced. There is a discrete spectrum that is tied to the characteristic binding energies of tungsten electrons. So every time there's a binding energy of a tungsten electron, I see a little boom. And this one right here is actually the one that I like because it's, it's the 69 kilo electron volts for that K-shell tungsten, right? It's useful. It's a useful one. Everything south of it, useless. 
So what I'm trying to do is get rid of this junk while keeping as much as possible of this junk, right? So this was without any filtration, I'm gonna have all of this garbage. This is just trash. It would just hit the patient's body, ionize their skin, potentially give them skin cancer, and it didn't in any way contribute to me getting a better picture. That's all it does, it doesn't have enough energy. So I add some inherent filtration. The x-ray tube itself has some filtration in it. And so now I've gotten rid of all this crap. I just have these guys, right? So I significantly decrease the quantity of x-rays. I significantly decrease the number of x-rays being produced. But look what else I did. I also shifted the average energy over. This whole sec, I feel like the weatherman right now. This whole section moved over, right? And that's a good thing. So let's add the total filtration, right? So this is both the inherent filtration and any added filtration, which has to equal what in my x-ray tube? 2.5, a millimeter aluminum equivalent. That's important, that aluminum equivalent is important. It's gonna further shift this line over. You can see it further dropped the number, right? But it also gave me a little bump to the right of average KVP. Okay, very, very helpful graphic. So let's talk about, we're going to continue with this bullet metaphor, right? What exactly are we saying with half value layer? Well, what we're measuring is the intensity of this x-ray beam that we're producing based on what it can get through. Can it get through an apple? Okay, whatever. A, a BB can get through an apple, maybe. Can it get through Kevlar? That's the question. Can it get through Kevlar? So the harder the beam is, the more it can get through, right? And that's actually our friend in that regard, because um, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to get enough penetration to get a picture. Now what's interesting, if you think about it, is this is also why we wouldn't want to just keep on increasing the KVP endlessly, right? Because we're not trying to image Kevlar. We're trying to image something more like an apple. So if I keep on increasing the KVP, everything I shoot at, it's going to get through the apple. There's not going to be a picture, right? There's not going to be a picture. I need some of it to get stopped and some of it to keep going, right? Are y'all tracking with me? Okay. So the half value layer is the amount of a specified absorbing material generally lead needed to reduce the intensity of the x-ray um, to one half of its original intensity. So that photon count, that exposure count, on one side of this material is going to be half what it was on the other side. The number of bullets getting through is going to be reduced by half. I will call that a half value layer. It is the most accurate measure of penetrability. I'll say that again, it's the most accurate measure of penetrability. So we do not necessarily, when I'm really thinking about quality, I'm thinking hard about x-ray quality, my mind starts to shift away from KVP and more towards half value layer. As an x-ray tech, if I'm really thinking hard about beam quality, I start to think more about penetrability and how that can best be measured best be expressed by the beam's half value layer. Now I can actually measure this thing, right? I'm not just conjecturing about it. Because we've said when we're setting KVP, we're basically setting rainbows. We've got a whole spectrum of energies that's coming out of that extra tube. This is getting it more and more heavy metal. Where all there is is just grays and blacks coming out of that thing, right? It's just, it's hardening it down to just a, a single spectrum of energy. So. Penetrability is directly affected by KVP, generator power, and filtration. That's why I'm bringing it up here. We've had enough understanding of this material to, to now speak about half value layer. So any increase to KVP, power generation, or filtration will increase the average um, uh, half value layer of the beam. Okay? So as I increase my half value layer, it would stand to reason I'm also doing something to increase my average KV. 
The government regulations, they publish minimum half value layer requirements on tables, and that's what we pay the physicists to sit around and figure out. I'm not going to expect you all to be able to regurgitate half value layers for every machine that you work on, because guess what? It's different for everything. I mean, these, these publications look like the phone book times 10. They're huge. Um, so nevertheless, this is again why we pay the physicists to sit there and do annual checks that are required every 13 months to measure half value layer. If the half value layer for the machine is measured to be less, then they add filtration. It's kind of counterintuitive. That's why I'm stressing this. If the half value layer for the machine, the penetrability measure of the machine is not getting through Kevlar, what do I do? I increase the rifling. I increase the filtration, and now I'm going to be able to get through the Kevlar. Right? So that's exactly how it works in terms of the physics checks that they do annually on the machine. They, they measure half value layer for the machine. Does, is it in accordance with the government regulations? If not, guess what? We need to open up that slot between the tube and the collimator and add some filtration to filter out some more of those weak x-rays and get hard in the beam, right? And again, it is primarily done for patient radiation protection. So filtration does. It does increase the average KVP and penetrability of the x-ray beam, okay? But I want to say this. We don't want to just keep on adding filtration, adding filtration. Eventually, we would start to impact the beam. And sometimes certain classes and certain teachers start asking kind of hypotheticals what would happen if you started adding more and more filtration. Forget all about that. I just want you to know that the maximum amount of filtration, or the correct amount of filtration, is the maximum amount that does not affect exposure quantity at the IR. Right? I want to filter out all the junk without af affecting any of the good stuff. Right? Um, excessive filtration, and this is largely an ac academic point, would decrease image receptor exposure, so it would decrease quantity, as well as decrease the subject contrast and increase grayscale. It's mostly an academic point. If I added too much filtration, I would have now a decrease in quantity and a decrease in subject contrast and increase in grayscale. Because I would just be, the average KVP would swing that much further um, to the right on our scale. Let's talk about what it doesn't do. When uh, properly used, filtration does not reduce intensity of the remnant beam at the IR. So it does not affect the remnant beam that's reaching the image receptor when it's properly used. And in daily practice, which is a, kind of his way of saying, um, in general use, or if you want to think generally about filtration, it should not be considered a factor affecting any radiographic imaging qualities. It did not affect the brightness, it did not affect the contrast, it did not affect sharpness, it did not affect anything. What did it do? It decreased patient dose. That's all it did. It did not affect anything about the picture, okay? But there's a but here. But I do want to talk about compensating filtration, okay? So to recap real quick about the kind of filtration that we use most generally, well, I'll just call it filtration. All it does is decrease patient dose, period. It doesn't affect the way the picture looks at all. Right? If we want to jack with the way the picture looks, we need to pull up a compensating filter. And this is why the radiation therapists now get paid the big bucks. They sit around and they think about compensating filtration all day long. It's a big part. If you ever want to ask them about the wedges that they use and how heavy they are, right? Because that's what they're doing is they're compensating for the contours of anatomy and shaping the x-ray beam to the area that they're treating. We used to do this more as x-ray techs, but we now it's mostly a historical note. He does offer some good examples of possible continuation of, comp of compensating filtration on page uh, 268 and 269. But mostly this is handled by our computers now. So we used to use very thick compensating filtrations to shape the x-ray beam to the unusual shape of a body part. So an example of where this might be helpful 
would be um, ex using wedges on feet or for swimmers laterals, which we're doing right now in the lab. You could use a wedge on a swimmer's lateral and it's gonna help you get a little bit better picture, right? You're gonna filter out, you're gonna use the heavy part on the short, on the thin part of the anatomy and the thin part of the wedge on the thick part of the anatomy. So any registry question that I can think of is deals with that. If you're placing a compensating filter over a foot, where does the thick part need to be? It needs to be over the toes. Right? Um, and this illustrates that pretty well. All right, thank you all so much.